Hello, I'm Dr. Newberry, and I'm going to be serving as your host for this Physician Spotlight. I'm very excited to be sitting here today with Dr. Carol Semrad, who's a professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. Um, Dr. Semrad, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. I'm happy to be here. And um, I wanted to get started by just asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself. So I had somewhat of a unique career. I started out in internal medicine and I was interested pretty quickly in the small bowel with regard to diarrheal diseases and then joined a lab with Dr. Michael Field to do basic science work in ion transport in the intestine, which was a four year postdoc fellowship. And so from that point on, I was always driven by patient care and discovery and pushing medicine forward. And so I decided to then transition to be an expert in the small bowel. And as part of that, uh, of course, nutrition was a, a big part because that's the most important function of the small intestine. And so like the kidney, I decided I needed to know about nutrition and how to support if the intestine wasn't working. So that led me to realize that training and nutrition was fairly um, limited in GI programs. I was a gastroenterologist at that part point. And so then I joined Dr. Scheich in, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And that was a perfect fit for me because he was a gastroenterologist who ran nutrition there. And he was the first person to put a direct uh, endoscopic jejunostomy tube in and taught me that. I took it back to Columbia where I was at that time. So a lot of career is luck and opportunity and knowing when to take the opportunities, I think would be my strongest statement here. Right. And yes, I mean, that's really interesting to hear. And definitely as a, a junior gastroenterologist interested in nutrition, I, I know Dr. Scheich, who's just across the street from us here um, in New York City. And um, you know, such great people to be following in the footsteps. Um, in terms of, you know, incorporating that nutrition education into, you know, physician programs and physician training, um, I know that you've done some work in that, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. Yes, I think I was fortunate at Columbia, I had a, and at the University of Chicago, I had a fellowship slot, which is very unusual to have a one-year um, paid a uh, slot to train a fellow in nutrition. And so um, I was always interested in trying to find people who would stay in the area of nutrition. So people think they have an interest, but in the end, it's quite a rigorous field. It's, it encompasses metabolism and the depth and breadth of disease, surgical, it covers everything, including psychiatry. So it's really um, a, a very all-encompassing area of work. And some people just don't want to be sort of that involved in disease and management. So um, I always was trying to choose people who were interested in making it their career so we could populate the rest of the United States with experts in nutrition. And I wasn't so particular whether it was someone in endocrinology or nephrology or GI or internal medicine. It really was the interest in, in doing the work and learning about nutrition support and doing it well for society, really. Right, absolutely. Um, obviously, those tenants are all very important. Um, if you had to give some advice to uh, either junior physicians or uh, dietitians or nurse practitioners, people working in the nutrition space and how to build a career within nutrition, you know, what advice would you give them? Well, the best advice is always you have to follow what you're interested in. If you're not interested just because something is underpopulated with doctors doesn't mean you should embrace that and do it. You should do what you're interested in, first of all. But then once you have the interest, you have to seek out who is the best and capable of training you. And that takes a bit of work and a bit of stepping outside of comfort zones and taking some risks as to how it's all going to work out in the end. So it has to start with interest. And then, of course, 
you have to know what you know, what you don't know. You cannot direct something you have not done and do not know how to do. No matter how good your team is, you have to have had hands-on experience writing parental nutrition orders, taking care of people who are tube fed. You have to be the first on the line from a medical point of view to know how to take care of sick patients because most patients with intestinal failure problems are not healthy people. So these are sick, complex patients. So you really have to um, take that on and learn it yourself first and not depend on your team. You have to be part of the team in your own complete knowledge expertise base. Um, I think that that resonates with a lot of us sort of trying to build these careers. And, you know, in your opinion, what do you think the biggest challenges for uh, providers that want to work within the nutrition um, realm? Oh, hands down, it's the lack of people who do it and have expertise in it. I mean, there are, okay, I'm in a big city, maybe in the big cities, there's always someone who does nutrition support well and runs a program as a physician. But if you're in smaller places, um, and not all big cities even have, you know, really sort of high-end nutrition support teams. So the hardest part is finding the person who's going to train you and who, who, you know, part of it is we don't have support for such a fellowship. Very few people do. And then we try to piece it together through industry in a month here and a month there. But I have to say, in my experience, spending time with Dr. Scheich in a continuous way was really what helped me become a true, if you want to call it an expert, I've done, been doing it for 30 some years, so I think I am, but, but it really allowed me to get into the very fine details and the depth and breadth of patients who I had to care for and all the ant questions I had and reading, you know, reading the literature as I'm seeing different patients. So it took a great amount of effort on my own personal part, but also I needed the experts to train me. I, it's not just by video or by, you know, one week rotation and someone's on someone's support team. It's better than nothing, but honestly, we need to have fellowships to train people who want to be trained. And that has to be uh, whether it's through Aspen or through the government or whoever, it has to first acknowledge there's a a dangerous paucity of people who can do this and then the support we need to get and how to do that at the national, you know, how to lobby for that and really get money into it. I think this is the challenge younger people are going to have to fight for this um, to keep it going. Uh, I don't know how else it can because I can only train one person a year. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I mean, definitely increasing resources for nutrition programs in general is so important. And I know that, yeah, I mean, organizations like national organizations like Aspen certainly are in the advocacy um, world and that any of us interested in nutrition probably need to start looking into that landscape as well. Um, yes. I think that's a nice segue too, to, you know, you identify Dr. Scheich as obviously a mentor for you. Was there anyone else in your career that you felt really shaped um, who you became? Yes, my first mentor, Dr. Michael Field and Jean Chang, who's here at the University of Chicago, they were there. Jean Chang is still active in basic science, but the basic science is really key. I'll tell you, you think, oh, that was kind of, I became clinical. Why did you spend time even doing that? I mean, I wasn't at the bench doing basic science my whole career, but reading journals and basic science articles and understanding molecular techniques and technologies when you have to interpret clinical data, that was priceless. And having those critical minds that I could walk into the office every day to talk about an article on chloride secretion or sodium absorption or cystic fibrosis, which was a big thing was identifying the chloride channel that secreted both from a diarrhea point of view and from a cystic fibrosis point where it wasn't functional. So that was a big deal to try to molecularly, to on a molecular level, identify the transporter and the regulation process. And that changes your whole way of thinking clinically when you get down to that level of physiology and molecular and genetics. 
So that was priceless in terms of really, as a physician, being a very, very in-depth kind of physician in, in the chosen area, whatever you choose, whether it's nutrition or you know, other aspects of the GI tract. Every aspect of the GI tract has its own mechanisms and regulation and all of that. And all of that becomes important for therapy. So you can read, you can interpret the literature much easier if you've had some basic science training, but it's gotta be with someone again, who's really good and is gonna mentor you for real, have that door open that you can talk to them and you're in close contact with your mentor, not as part of some machine factory where you're, you know, kind of a cog in the wheel. If those days exist still, but that was probably hands down my three most important people in my career. And they supported me my entire career. They never forgot about me, which is good. Right. And it sounds like, I mean, every interview I think I do with a lot of senior faculty members, you know, they talk about the importance of mentorship and identifying those people early and, and building those relationships. And it's so nice to hear about relationships you've built and still have, you know, 30 years into your career, um, you know, being a senior expert at this point, but still, you know, having mentorship relationships. Yes. And I might add, I don't want to, uh, the Dr. Scheich's nutrition support team was incredible, by the way. They did a lot of the basic training of me. He, of course, put it all in perspective on our rounds, on our, on a, when we went to round on patients, but um, they were incredible. The, I think it was Mark, I can't remember, Cloggin, I can't remember. I'm very bad with last names, but Mark, Pat, and there was one other uh, nurse, two nurse practitioners and, and the pharmacist who were just taught me everything about the real uh, sort of uh, physical chemical aspects of the formula, PN formula in detail and depth. So I understood, well, how, did, how does this What's, what's compatible, what's not compatible, why in, in this incredible depth that I took with me and could just use my entire career that I didn't, you know, it wasn't a superficial education. It was an in-depth education by the support team as well. So I'm a big believer in nutrition support teams to manage people with nutrition problems, not just the doctor with a couple of stray pharmacists and dietitians running around and nurse practitioners. The team is what grows everyone's knowledge together. So whether I can act as a dietitian if I need to, or a nurse or a doctor, and anyone on my team almost can think like a doctor too, pretty close. So, but that comes from years of being on the team, rounding on patients, talking about it, teaching. You know, it's it's a process that, that um, I'm very fortunate. I have a phenomenal team here and I enjoy rounding with them every day. They teach me, I teach them. It's good. Absolutely. Um, definitely you are also the people you surround yourself with. Um, yes, for I'd, sure. <laughs> I'd love to hear a little bit more about the nutrition support team model at University of Chicago. You know, we've been talking to different people about how their models are, are structured. So I'd love to hear more about yours. So I stepped into a tradition at the University of Chicago, very strong in nutrition, which is one of the reasons I left Columbia to come here because it was a good fit for me. So they already had a, a well-established team that was at that time a pharmacist, a, a dietitian, and a nurse. And it was always an advanced nurse, even back then before I think practitioners, it's sort of historic, but, um, and that was the, team then. Uh, now we've expanded a bit because we manage people in the inpatient and outpatient setting and those patients are complex and they're growing. Um, I, you know, we talk about short bowel syndrome being rare, uh, but if you take all people who have malabsorption and need to be monitored, whether they're on PN or on enteral feed or not on it's a big population of people at this point because it's not just about the people who became short from inflammatory bowel disease in the past. It's about all of these surgical and these intense uh, cancer patients where they're doing these very radical debulking procedures. And uh, it's just grown into more people than we think. 
uh, exist out there. I think our data is old from the past and our definition of short, of short bowel is evolved into short bowel being malabsorption and this, when you can't keep yourself uh, nourished by your own eating, then you're intestinal failure. So we used to just call short bowel intestinal failure. You had to be on PN and that was our definition. But not so now, we're trying to change it for purposes of reimbursement and taking care of these patients to recognize that some people are on the edge and they need very close monitoring and good care the same way someone on parenteral nutrition needs that kind of care. And who's gonna care for those people better than a support team? So then, it, but then you have to expand your team. So now I have three dietitians, one nurse practitioner or a nurse in a, uh, a nurse who does, I don't know, it's not a practitioner, but she does line care. She's an expert in lines and a pharmacist who's knowledgeable in home care and inpatient parental nutrition. So the team is big. Of course, bigger teams, there's some downsides to bigger teams because it's harder to round when you've got such massive, you know, groups walking around. And so it makes it a little less intimate, but nonetheless, we're taking care of a high number of patients in the Chicago area. And I have to say the other part of nutrition, people go, oh, well, what, you know, what's in it for you? But what's in it is you take these people who are like nearly starving to death on death's door, not because anyone meant for that to happen, but because there was just the way healthcare occurs and people lose weight and they think they're gonna get better the next month, the next month, and it's just they, deteriorate and you take them and you bring them back to full health where they're working there. These are not people who are crippled or maimed or, you know, having severe um, health problems. These are people who would be otherwise healthy, who can then go on and have their life restored to them and to their family. So it's a very gratifying area, actually. Um, in terms of management, it also we manage in the inpatient and outpatient settings. So we get to know these people and their families extremely well. So for me, that's my model of care, of patient care is continuity. The, the, the payoff is not the moment you do something to a patient randomly in the hospital. It's when you they go home and they come back to you and you see how well they're doing and they're grateful and you're happy. And, you know, you have this real sense that you've accomplished and you're keeping someone healthy in their life so they can be as functional as possible. And I, I think that part is so rewarding with nutrition. And sometimes people don't see that part because they go, oh, these, are, these people are so complex, they're so sick. But, you know, part of it is just the nutrition part that really can restore a lot of good function in these patients. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that certainly will resonate with the community watching um, these videos. Um, you know, I wanted to thank you for sitting down and speaking with us today. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add for the community before we ended our interview. Um, no, I think our biggest problem right now in healthcare is we've lost our voice to administration. And if I had anything to say, it would be a grassroots effort for all leaders of medicine and surgery to come together and to take medicine healthcare back into the hands of the healthcare providers and away from the dollar, the administrative sort of bean counting. I know that that's important, but in the end, what's more important is that the experts who know how to take care of patients are, are being um, sort of hampered by a lot of administration rules that just don't fit for patient care. And so if I had anything to say in this, if anyone's listening is to that we're gonna to have to, as anything in COVID, we have to fight together. We can't fight at our own local level within our university or our institution. We have to be unified to support each other and protect each other and work to be the experts and to help set this, these rules and care so that it's for the patient and not about the dollar. And, I get having to 
that there's money, there's only so much money available, but there's another thing called for-profit medicine. And I don't see that that has a place in taking care of sick and vulnerable people. I think we have to funnel as much money as we can towards care and towards discovery and towards making people's lives better in the future. So I don't know how we can accomplish that. I accomplish it on a personal level, but I realize as I get older, we need, it's not just me alone. I'm going to at some point point be out of it and the younger people are left having to still do the same have the same purpose to take care of human life and they're going to need to have say in how the day runs how many patients you can see at once you know all of that that we're all struggling with right now with the computerized medical system as well and we're all struggling and um, I don't think we're being heard. I think we're being told to go do yoga and this and that. And I'm sorry, it's not about yoga. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really about our knowledge of people, our fear that they're, um, that we're not, we don't have the time to quite do what we have to do to take good care of people. And so that's my, uh, a final plea is for us to come together and to really work to get administration to get us to give us a voice a higher voice than what we have now because we don't absolutely um and i think that's a great closing statement for this interview and this um, audience of people that watch these interviews so i wanted to thank everyone for joining us for another position spotlight interview with dr carol samrad here at the university of chicago thank you thank you have a good day.